Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're going to call the regular city council meeting to order March 17, 2014. Uh, can we have roll call, please? Council Member Edgar? Here. Council Member Gross? Here. Council Member Kusumoto? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Murphy? Here. Mayor Graham Mejia? Here. Uh, please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance by uh, Council Member Murphy and stand for the invocation by Council Member Edgar. Sorry. Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. Right. <laughs> We're going to pledge allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the invocation. Thank you, Richard. Please bow your head. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to serve this great community. Lord, we just pray that this evening that you're here with everybody in this chamber, and within our community and that you help give us some clear guidance on the direction on our what items that we talk about on our agenda. Lord, we just want to thank you for our staff. I want to thank you for my colleagues on the council and, uh, and again for the opportunity to serve. Lord, be with us in your name. Amen. 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 All right. We have a presentation for Purple Heart Month. If I can have the council join me down in front, please. I can get my glasses so I can read. <laughs> recognizes American soldiers wounded or killed in the line of duty and it's embrazened with George Washington's profile on the coat of arms. The state of California became the first state to designate itself as a Purple Heart state in recognition of the sacrifices of California veterans. We wish to honor and thank all veterans who have been wounded or killed in the line of duty for their selfless sacrifice to the United States of America. I'd like to present this to Danny and on behalf of all those soldiers and all that you represent and I would just like to say I'm so pleased that you were able to be here and be a part of this celebration because without the work that the military does for this country it would look very different and we are so eternally grateful. Well, <clears throat> we thank you very much. Uh, we represent Chapter 752 that meets in Midway City. <clears throat> we have 125 of us on the rolls over there. We're always looking for new members, and you guys have new members from your community that come back from uh, overseas service with wounds, and if you can refer them to us, we'll try to help them any way we can in getting VA treatment and so on. But we want to thank the city for this. <coughs> uh, as she said, uh, the state of California is the first state to become Purple Heart State in April of 2012. Garden Grove was the first city in Orange County in November of 2012. Uh, we did Orange County uh, November of 2013, and now most of the cities are falling in line, and we really appreciate it, and uh, we, you know, hope that uh, you all uh, actually uh, have some appreciation for what we did do. I'd like to introduce a couple of guys here. Arnie Hansen, stand up, Arnie. He's our... <coughs> Arnie is our most mature member. He's 99. He's a World War II vet and uh, was wounded in the European theater. And uh, Don Pagler here is a survivor of the U.S. Liberty. The, the U.S. Liberty is a ship that was fired on by the Israelis. And uh, most of them died on that ship. Don was one of the survivors, and our country did not go to their aid at the time. So uh, he's lucky to be here. But thank you very much. Thank you. Are we? Yeah. yeah. Would you like to share about that? Uh, well, What's if you want me to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. She, she asked me about my POW MIA bracelets. Uh, they both happen to be childhood friends of mine. 
Uh, one was a Marine. He died in, outside Da Nang in um, 68. Uh, the other one was an Air Force pilot. Um, he flew an OV-10A, was hit by a SAM missile, still MIA. He was never recovered. Uh, the only, I finally found out in 1991 that they found his uh, military ID card in a museum in Hanoi. So that's about the only uh, thing that has survived from him. Um, I lost his mother uh, a little over a year, almost two years ago. But um, so anyway, they paid the ultimate price for our freedom. If people are interested, I know when my sister was in high school, you could get these and you would keep those people in prayer and try and stay up on what exactly their status was. If you can still get them. How do yeah. you do that? Do you know? Well, yeah, I have a website. If you want, I can okay, send great. it to Why you. Don't you, go ahead. If, if you I, well, I don't have it with oh, me. I don't. Okay. Know, but but if you, somebody wants to give me their email, I'll email you the, Absolutely. the website. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll I'll give and I'll give you, give you my card. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And and yourself, sir, would you like to come up and speak? Arnie? Yeah, you can just turn around. Go ahead. Uh, I guess I have that same problem. Just stay there. Just stay there. Just stay right there. Just stay right there. Give me your <clears throat> Sorry, I can't <clears throat> stand very much. <clears throat> I was in the Signal Corps <clears throat> in the <clears throat> Pacific Theater. I, <clears throat> I was up on a 35-foot uh, pole, and it was knocked out from under me. Uh, uh, <clears throat> resulted in a bad back, which still gives me a lot of pain. Uh, I was uh, kind of, sh my <clears throat> active duty was kind of short after we got to Okinawa. We landed on the 1st of April. <clears throat> I was injured on the 21st. <clears throat> got <clears throat> back to Okinawa in July, <clears throat> and then went to Korea. I was in Korea for about four months, and back to the States. Thank you so much for coming. Oh. Perfect. All right. Well, I think this is so lucky for us. For you servicemen, we are lucky to have our high school students who come for their government class. And for all of you, what a very unique opportunity to meet some of the people who actually served in some of the wars you might be studying. So please, if you have an opportunity, thank these gentlemen for their service as they leave. One additional thing, there is a thing called the Freedom Committee of Orange County, and its function is it, it establishes lectures and uh, interviews with high school students so that they can do projects and papers based on uh, uh, veterans' firsthand experience rather than uh, you know stuff they read out of a history book. So well, that's great. Actually, we're and our chapter 752 gives a scholarship every year to uh, a high school student. So okay. if we could get that information, we do have a working group with the school district, and we would love to share that information with them. So if we can have a round of applause, please. Beautiful bride. Wow. Okay, next we have a update presentation regarding the Time Warner Cable by Christy Hennessy, Vice President of Government Relations. Christy, if you could come forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, members of the Council. Um, this evening I'm here to talk about a couple of things that are going on in the organization, and I think I'll start first, if I may, with uh, the handouts that I've provided. In here is just a lot of data and detail about our subscriber numbers. Particularly, we do California numbers and we do um, national numbers. Los Alamitos, uh, we can provide those numbers separately, uh, but uh, this gives you a good illustration of what we're contributing to the California economy. 
particularly in the area of jobs, one of the things that we've been able to do is our business traditionally was a residential video business when we built the cable plants back in, oh, whether it was the 70s or the 80s, when we originally built this, video was going into residential homes. There wasn't a market for commercial facilities. There just wasn't a payback for that. Uh, but since the advent of the Internet in 1998, via cable modems, it changed everything for us. And then we introduced telephone service in 2003, so we had the suite of all three products. So when we added the Internet piece, it changed the dynamics for us completely because businesses then became very interested in our product. And so it's created a whole other level within our organization. We have the residential side, which is about 7,500 employees, but we've also mirrored that on the commercial side because we need a whole new sales force to attack and address those mm. businesses. So um, it's created jobs. It's created whether it be you know, vendors that we have to buy the fiber from, uh, employees that we have to hire to sell the product, et cetera. So we're real excited about that. And if the city looks at their um, revenues on the franchise fee side, you'll see that despite competition, those numbers, I would venture to guess, have always gone up in Los, Alame uh, Los Alamitos and any other community because we keep adding and developing other services that are franchise fee based. Um, franchise fees are on the video service, and so when we create things like a you know, digital video recorders or any of the on-demand programming that you order, all of that is franchise fee based. So it's truly a partnership between the cable operator and the city in that respect. So we're happy to say that business is good. Um, I think on that note, I'll segue a little bit to the Comcast merger. Uh, we announced that. Comcast announced the merger and Time Warner did. It's a friendly merger. It's a stock for stock transition. I would imagine that it will probably take anywhere from nine months to a year for all the approvals to go through. We don't expect, that for in the meantime, business as usual for us. We have to continue to operate that way and we're still focused on the road. We still have to report to our leadership and shareholders. So it's business as usual for us. And um, as it develops, we'll, we'll keep the uh, council and the city updated on that progress. They're a great company. They're actually the largest cable provider in the nation. Um, they, they, um, they're very innovative. They have all of the advanced services that we have, and I would expect with the acquisition that it will become even more robust in terms of what Comcast plans to do in this market. They'll have those efficiencies. Um, it does not reduce competition. That's one of the questions that has come up. We don't compete head-to-head -head with Comcast. We compete with other providers in the city, but we're not overbuilt with Comcast. So if there's any concerns about it's going to reduce choices in the community, it doesn't because they're not a provider otherwise in the city. Um, so let's see. I think I'll move to the Super Bowl outage, and I'll end on a more positive note. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So the only thing I can really say is that we apologize. Um, we run a very technical organization, a very technical operations, and it was just one of those very, very, very unfortunate incidents that we did have an outage. Um, it was software related. I hate to say it's software because so many things can be attributed to that. But I did have very specific conversations with our engineers to find out exactly what it was. And it was software related. Um, there's a lot of buts and buttons and parts and pieces that we have to keep together. It's a very technical business. So um, there was nothing more that we could say to our customers and that we were very, very sorry. We did do automatic $5 credits for those customers that are on the analog side and for those customers that are on uh, the digital side, we sent them a free on-demand movie. They didn't have to request that. We did that automatically along with the, an apology letter. And um, the only upside to that was that if you were HD, or a lot of folks know, just turned to HD feed, it did not impact the high definition feed. So luckily not all customers were without service, but we're very sorry, very much apologize. It, it is not acceptable. Um, then I think I'll talk a little bit about, we are going to be doing some infrastructure upgrades, speaking of infrastructure and, and software. We have to, we continue to do that because customers want it, they demand that type of content. We've got 13,000 Wi-Fi hotspots in Southern California alone. Those are free Wi-Fi hotspots to our Time Warner Cable customers, so if you're a customer, you have access to data. You, you sign on automatically, I believe it stays um, updated for 90 days and then you just refresh every now and then. If you're 
not a Time Warner cable customer, you can buy the data. We have a pay model. But for us, it's very much about retention, making the product uh, attractive to our customers, make it, um, making them want to stay on the product and staying very competitive. Um, and it also, we do talk with cities about if they want free Wi-Fi, we will talk with cities about doing it at city halls, at parks, um, in police sites, whatever the wish list is for the city, a senior center, a community center, wherever there's a lot of high foot traffic, those are the locations that we target, any retail centers as well where folks are hanging out. We're talking more with the schools. We have a little bit more um, difficulty getting into the schools just because of some of the rules governing it, but we do talk with schools and hopefully one day we'll really expand in that area because there's a lot of people that are sitting there dropping off their kids, picking up their kids, and they want to have access to that data. So, But we're happy to say 13,000 hotspots in Southern California. And if you travel to New York, which is a market that we have, or if you go to Texas or the Ohio's or Carolinas, you have, and you're a Time Warner Cable customer because we serve those markets, you have access there as well. Um, so let's see, on the education front, I see all the students here tonight, so that's, that's very cool, I like that. Um, we, we serve about 4,000 cities, towns, villages across the nation, and we found that our dollars were going, our philanthropic dollars were going to a lot of different locations, and we had to really focus on what are we going to put our philanthropic, our community affairs efforts towards. And while we very much support veterans, we have a VetNet program. We very much support diverse programs. We work with um, uh, a lot of the minority-owned businesses. We have a monthly webinar to tell minority-owned businesses how they can do business and become a, a customer for Time Warner, a client for Time Warner Cable, or provider for us. Um, but on the education side, we focus on STEM initiatives: science, technology, engineering, and math. We had to drill it down and make sure our dollars were, were being um, used the best that we could. We have an application site. We call our program Connect a Million Minds. The yellow brochure outlines a bit about that program and how we can get our kids interested in the, these initiatives and these disciplines. They, they love using their iPads and their smartphones, but it's how does that video get there? How did that text get there? It takes technology. It takes science and engineering. And, most kids and math, and, and most kids statistically would prefer to um, take out the trash, you know, make their bed, clean their room, than, than study those disciplines. And we want to try and make it fun for them and use our own engineers to teach students. So we try and work with a lot of the middle school and after school programs. Um, so if you have any uh, groups that will be interested in that, we do have an application side. It's on, we call it Connect a Million Minds. Mm -hmm. And um, we're just shy of our millionth student that we're getting into the program, so we're real excited about that, and there's uh, more information in the packet. Great. Um, so that's my summary. I hope that was in line, and I'm available for questions. Perfect. We'll bring it back to the council. Anyone who has questions? I, I do. So I uh, thank you for being here. Um, of course. And then I'm interested in the, the Wi-Fi hotspot model of yours. What's the bandwidth? Is it to actually stream video to tablets and smartphones? Is that uh, kind of what you're looking for? Or is it more of just connectivity for emails and what have you? No, I believe it will stream. Okay. It does a very, it's not a huge range because the devices are like a bread box. They're not huge, mm -hmm. about 300 feet. I'll find out the exact. But, well, I, I, I'm just curious, is, and then, and then the part about the STEM, uh, I'm very interested in that. So, uh, have you reached out to the schools, especially like our school here in, in the uh, Los Alamitos School District, on uh, STEM initiatives that they may be uh, interested in? That might be a, uh, a partnership you can look into. Um, and, I believe we have reached out. We send mailers when we initially look, ran the program, rolled the program out. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to probably make another pass at them, and then we definitely talk with the nonprofit. Th there's a school board member here that you might want to okay. chat with before mm -hmm. you leave and before Absolutely. she leaves. And, and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you being here and sharing this. It's um, uh, very enlightening, and uh, thank you for what you do for the community. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. Great. Anyone else? I have a question, yes. Council Member Gross? In regards to the merger with Cox, um, I'm sorry, Comcast. Comcast. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys currently provide um, peg fees to the city. Will there be any change, perhaps additional funding that will come as a result of that, or has that part been discussed, and how do we engage with you in that? That has not even been discussed yet. It was just announced recently, and we haven't even had our first um, introductory meeting with those, okay. those staff members. But as time goes by, all of that will develop. Yeah. 
we, we would like to be kept in the loop on that if you will do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? <clears throat> Councilman Rager? Uh, hi, Christy. Hi. I, I just wanted to tell you thank you for coming down. You've uh, always been a big uh, supporter in our community. And uh, I know with the Comcast thing, I think uh, that assembly bill that changed the, uh, the fees, I, I don't think it will have an effect because that pretty much mandated at a state level what we were actually entitled to uh, by household. But, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're helpful and uh, we'll, it, whatever we can do to help out, um, you know, there's two different types of carriers in our community. And, uh, and, and you've, from the very beginning, have always been, you're one of the big reasons why we've had LATV and we've been able to get it off the ground. And you accepted competition, not happy, but uh, back in 2006. And uh, you've always continued to be a good partner. And we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's our pleasure. Um, I'm relatively local. I have an office in Ontario and I have a satellite office in Anaheim. I just moved back to Orange County from the Inland Empire. So if you guys ever need anything, I'm a call away or an email away. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. All right. thank Anyone you very else? Much. All right. Thank you, Christy, for coming. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Appreciate it. Move on to item C update uh, presentation regarding the Los Alamos Hospital expan expansion from city staff. <coughs> thank you, Mayor and City Council. Then our city engineer, Dave Hunt, will do the presentation. This is an update on upcoming construction project that the hospital will be undertaking in the press release and the public relations campaign that will be taking place. Hey, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, back when uh, the City Council approved the EIR, uh, this exhibit was, was in the EIR. It shows you all the different improvements that's going to go on out there between Bloomfield and Cherry Street. Uh, the main one is going to be a, a traffic signal at uh, Kaler Street. It's going to be added. And then we're adjusting, adding median islands uh, and uh, left turn lanes that are going to go into the new parking structure and also going to close or prevent the ability of Maple Street from making a left turn out on Catella Avenue. Uh, those are kind of some of the, the major things that are going on. Plans have been designed, uh, been reviewed by both myself and Stephen Mendoza and our traffic engineer and have gone through all the proper steps on that. Uh, Big picture on the schedule, we're going to start our outreach program uh, over the next 11 days so that we can get the community uh, aware of what's going on and so that uh, this is not a su surprise to them. Construction is scheduled to start on March 27th and at that time the number one lane in each direction, westbound and eastbound, will be closed so they can start removal of the uh, the asphalt that's out there and start construction curb gutters and the median islands and that'll be their working area that's in in there. We have uh, daily working hours from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Stephen Mendoza has talked to the convalescent hospital across the street and, and they were all for having extended hours to try and get this work done so we've told the contractor that they, they can work actually later than that and, uh, and weekends to try and help this project get done and they're trying to get some of that into their schedule to help on there. At the end, uh, it's a 10-week project, and the project will be done on, on June 6th, around June 6th there of this year. Uh, for the lane closures for the median islands, that should be around a seven-week closure, and it won't be the whole 10 weeks. That'll be for the median islands in there. We'll get that done. The last few weeks, they'll be doing the landscaping inside there uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and the traffic signals. So there will be, the actual closure process should be hopefully in the, in the seven-week the seven week bracket. I will be working with the contractor to even try and short, shorten that like I did on the Chestnut Project and we'll try and get it done as fast as, as we can. Uh, we will be putting uh, some message signs out between two on Catella, one right across the street from City Hall out here notifying cars going eastbound and one out there uh, just east of, of Bloomfield, notifying them coming up. We'll be putting those out tomorrow. Also one on Los Alamitos Boulevard going northbound between Farquhar and Catella Avenue, notifying them of the same thing. We do have a, a news release that uh, is going to go on our website. We're going to give it to the newspapers and, and online services out there to keep them, them informed. There is also a dedicated website that uh, they have put together and it's a, uh, it is at, uh, and I have it right in here, it's at Catella Avenue-ImprovementProjects.com. It will also be linked to our own website so you can get it from there. 
Uh, the, the overall schedule, uh, I can say, is we, we've done some preliminary work in here. Tonight we're kind of informing the City Council and everybody here. Uh, starting tomorrow and the rest of the week, uh, even uh, Stephen Mendoza and, uh, and Brett, our city manager, are going to go out and walk and talk to businesses and do some PR work out there in the street. Uh, we're going to put out some, uh, some, some, some mailers that are out there uh, within 1,000 feet of the site uh, for, for all the businesses. Basically, that's from like Portal to uh, Los Alamitos Boulevard and to all the residents south of Catella Avenue who will be given this information that's out there. We've mailed out to them. Uh, on the website, there will be an info sheet that kind of tells you who to contact that's out there. There's both Stephen Mendoza has his name on there, and so does uh, uh, Snyder Langston, the contractor. I have Peter here from Snyder Langston that will be glad to answer any questions when we're done. And with, oh, and also under other media stuff, we notify uh, Caltrans OCD on the connectors, you know, all the construction activities. They add it to their construction activity book. We have them fully aware of what's going on. Uh, this is important to keep them aware of it, and they put it in their publications, too, so it reaches a wider audience also. And, uh, and, and for them to be aware when they do night closures and put some more traffic down Catella that we're all on the same page and when this is going to go on. And uh, there's also some alert bulletins that we have that we will be putting out uh, in conjunction with any changes in activity that goes on in this project. So we're doing our best to let everybody be aware of what's going on in multiple different uh, ways. And uh, no doubt when the first day of construction is happening, like typically does, there will be people that you know, can say they, they've never seen any of this and all that, and it, it'll take a couple of days for them to find different routes and way to go. First two days are always tough on construction projects, but they, they do tend to, to smooth out after time. And with that, be glad to answer any questions you have. And again, I have Peter from Snyder Langston here from the contractor if you have any questions for him. Thank you. Bring it back to the council. Anyone who'd like to ask questions? Councilmember Gross. Thank you very much. I think it's extremely important for the residents and the businesses in the city to understand what this project is about. Um, many of us had to live with Garden Grove's efforts on Valley View when they undertook to change uh, some of the construction and, and put construction in where Valley View was uh, an alternate route for some of the things on the freeway. What this truly means is, is that one lane, the lane closest to the median on each direction, both east and west on Catella, are going to be closed. Um, in addition to that, uh, they're going to uh, periodically close other lanes. So it could be down to one lane only in east and west, but that would be for short periods of time, uh, not full length periods. That would only really be at night time. Are they allowed to go down to one lane in each direction and that be after like 8 o'clock at night? Didn't you say construction was from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m.? Yes, I did. So they, they will not be closing down any other lanes during construction, just one lane in each direction. They'll be working out there in that section. So if construction is 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., the other closures are at night? Well, I didn't mention any other closures at night. I'm just saying they'll, they'll have they'll be working in that in the number one lane in both sides. That is their construction zone. Okay. Once it is coned off, that that is where their crews will be working back and forth in there. The only thing you'll see is when the traffic signals turn and they need to get equipment off of there, they will drive through the lanes. But they will do that okay. during the breaks in the traffic. Well, coming coming westbound today on Catella at approximately 5:15. Three lanes solid, jammed all the way back east of Noel, and there's no construction. Right. It's just Catella is a extremely busy thoroughfare. I don't know if we're going to be marking off and blocking parking through that entire stretch so that that additional lane is available. It's something that we should be considering if if we're not doing it. We did consider that, and we had a long discussion with our traffic engineer over, over safety and liability. And it was decided that, uh, that it would be wise not to, to use that lane right next to the curb. 
that it would actually could create a more of a hazard for, for traffic. Mm -hmm. And that's not really during the, the, the peak travel time. It's really during the non-peak travel time and having that S-shaped curve going through Catella Avenue and going right up next to the curb that you can get cars that will hit the curb and launch and go into like the convalescent hospital and stuff like that. Uh, if you've been out there in the, in the middle of, of the night when they had the traffic detours off the freeway, uh, drivers treat could tell almost like a junior freeway during that time and it's very dangerous even though you put signs out there during construction slow down do all that it's still a quite hazardous thing so all that was discussed and it's better to have it into permanently you have two lanes that are straight keep things going and yes it's going to back up yes it's going to be inconvenient uh, but this is something that it's Catella Avenue and that's uh, that's going to happen it's happened it happens every time we do any work out there on Catella and uh, this is, you know, part of their condition to be able to get into their medical building and with the parking structure, this all has to be opened up and done before they can get occupancy in there. So it's it, a necessary a part of this job. I understand. I'm just saying that I think we're going to be under some, some, some very great pressure in this particular process because emergency vehicles coming in, not everybody is going to be aware of an alternate entrance to use to get over there. Many, many motorists are going to go south of Catella and go back through the neighborhoods, and that's been a long problem to begin with. Um, so the neighbors that are south of Catella need to be cognizant of that. Also need to be letting City Hall know when that kind of stuff occurs that creates an impact. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have this. We're going to have the same thing happen both north and south. Cerritos is going to be an increased street to get around a lot of this. And uh, there's not a lot of options when you're coming west or even really going east. Um, but I'm, I want residents to specifically keep City Hall advised so that the engineering department uh, has the ability to take action and make decisions along with the police department so that we have some method of keeping traffic moving because this is going to be a big impact. Big impact. So thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Kuzumoto. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report, uh, David. <clears throat> so something you had mentioned about trying to um, hurry the process along, and you said something like 10 weeks and you're going to try and shorten it, but how much, how much control influence do you have on this uh, project? For, I mean, because it's somebody else's project, right? Someone else is paying for it. Someone else has hired the uh, contractor. Yeah, the, the medical center is paying for it all. Yeah, okay. And, and they have a permit, and they have it, and we are working with them to try and, and, and get it done as smooth as possible. Uh, like anything, you know, time is money, and sure. they want to do it as fast as they can do it. That's so why we Perhaps the question, is there an incentive to finish earlier in place? And I'm not trying to help the hospital spend their money. I'm just kind of asking what, you know, what are the incentives to finish early? I don't believe he has any construction okay. incentives. Okay. And the, the other part is, um, from the city standpoint, are there um, things that your department would have to do in terms of inspections or reviews or checks or anything like that during the 10 weeks? And uh, if, if needed, um, you know, how committed are you and your department, your staff, to uh, be there if it's at 7 or 8 o'clock at night or 6 in the morning? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we have uh, our city staff will be out there on a daily basis, and I have overflow staff that can fill in when they can't do it and they need help. They go on. So okay, all the, would, the staff would not is like for us to be holding them up for making the progress they need to make, right? No, and actually, uh, and, I, and I always hate to say this, but it, it's it's actually a very simple job in there. I mean, we're pouring curb and gutter, mm. and some sidewalk. We're doing some some land. It's not difficult work. Uh, probably the traffic signals, the most complicated part of it, and tying into it. And our traffic engineer and guys that do all the signal timing will be out there when that part is, is going on. Uh, the construction in the, in the street part is very, you know, down to simple road construction work, nothing complicated. They're not doing tilt-up buildings out there. There's nothing out there that they're going to, they're only going to dig down at the most, you know, 18 to, uh, inches to 24 inches down in there and uh, remove what's there and put back in what necessary. So it's, uh, we, we shouldn't be finding hazardous waste. We shouldn't be finding groundwater <coughs> seeping up. Uh, all those issues that you have when you put in some deep type of structures or shouldn't be there. Okay. I, I would just like to make sure that whatever on, on your side of it, that you know, we're not holding up the progress. And, no, uh, we're not holding them up at all. Matter of fact, these plans and stuff have been approved and 
sitting on the shelf for at least six six months or so. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But now it's just the other part of uh, executing, right? To uh, what, whatever the you know uh, task you have to do, can you get it done as quickly or or better than quick, right? To to get it done, because as as Councilmember Gross says, you know, it's an impact to the, the drivers. Uh, you know, n not necessarily. I mean, plus our, our you know not in addition to our citizens, our residents, those people that use this as a as a conduit, a throughway, and uh, it's going to impact them and just yeah, be not very pleasant all around. So. Anything you do to make it less than 10 weeks would be, I'm sure, appreciated by all the drivers. Well, I mean, Dave and his team. Why don't you, why don't you go up to oh, the microphone? Yeah. Introduce yourself and go up there. Thanks, Arnie. My apologies. Oh. And thank you, Madam Mayor and the Council. Uh, my name is Peter Jung of Snyder Langston, a general contractor uh, since 1959 in Irvine, California. Uh, also a local resident, a uh, graduate of Los Alamitos High School. Small world. <laughs> um, speaking of the city and their performance, they've been great over the last, uh, since last May when we started. Uh, right now we're on schedule on a complex, multifaceted project. We have a 1,077 stall parking structure. We have a three-story tilt-up medical office building and an abundance of site work. So if they're if they hold the form for this off-site, I think we should be fine. Uh, both the office and the field side have been superb, and we just look forward to a su uh, successful, quick, expeditious project. Uh, as a project manager, I'm here on-site every day. Right. Uh, my superintendent and I are here to monitor progress, and we'll work with Dave uh, and his team on a daily basis to make sure that the project is as quick as it can be. Um, the number on the flyers uh, go straight to my office, uh, along with the city, along with Dave's contact number as well. So you know we'll answer any questions or concerns that we have, and um, if we have to table them with Dave and his team, then we will, and adjust accordingly. A relative to schedule, like I said, Dave hit it right. Time is money. As the project manager, the faster I can get in and out, the better it is for me. And my company. So, so approximately, so. how many? How, how big is the crew? Just rough number. We have one contractor, XL Paving. Approximately, I'd say between twenty to twenty-five people. Okay, that's good enough number. Thank I you. Think. I appreciate it. And, and thanks for coming up here and talking. And no problem at all. Report. That's all I have. If you want to stay, Peter, just in case others have questions. Sure. Uh, anyone else? Sure. Council. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. <laughs> So the project's going to be 56 days, correct? Correct. It's 10, it's ten weeks. Ten weeks. Okay. We're, are we working weekends? Not scheduled. No. And we're only working eight hours a day. That is correct. I was on Catella today along with Dean at the same time, and three lanes doesn't cut it. I don't know how two or one is going to cut it. Um, so if... if I have 56 days for a number, so please just allow me to use them. That's 448 hours of work it's going to take to complete the project. If we work 24 hours a day, we're done in 18 days instead of, instead of 11 weeks. That's one, one person, 448, right? <clears throat> Versus a crew, 24 times. No, 50, 56 work days times 8 hours. Times, tw times 24. 25 employees. Yeah. So that's a lot of hours. Yeah, it is. But it's the same whether they work it in eights or 24s or 11s. It's still going to be the same amount of man hours. I'm just trying to figure out how many hours they're working per day. Okay. So if you were to work 24 hours a day, you'd be done in three weeks, 18 days, um, two and a half weeks. I realize it's probably not possible to work 24 hours a day out there, but it would seem to me that you could definitely work 11 hours a day, which is 7 to 7 every day. I can't imagine the businesses that are going to have the lanes closed are going to be impacted any more by an 8-hour workday than they are an 11-hour workday. An 11-hour workday saves three weeks. That's three weeks of total congestion out there. That doesn't include if we were to work Saturdays. I mean, I, I don't... We're shut, you're, you're really shutting down the major artery of our city, and we're not, we're not doing half enough, in my opinion, to expedite this as much as possible. We're just accepting the fact that it's going to take 
10 weeks where there is a way conceivably could get done in three. Um, I, I'd, Dave, I'd certainly like us to see us go back and renegotiate this to shorten this as much as possible. Uh, like I said, I can't imagine seven to seven even being an, an item of objection in this case. And three extra days, three extra hours a day shortens your project by about 25 percent. So please look into this and get back to me if you could, or Brett, and he'll get back to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just kind of closing. So uh, one of the things I do outside is I own a construction company too. So I, I think that when you go back through this, you know, you got to follow the money of who's paying. Uh, city's not paying, the hospital is. And when they put this thing out for bid, they probably said, I don't want to have a bid for overtime hours. And so you got straight hour bids. And because it's a process that gets locked in. I don't know if you can go back and reopen a bid that was actually competed and won um, and reset it. I think the logic makes complete sense, but we probably should have given that type of direction or at least applied pressure back if the hospital was in the negotiations period. And, and I, I've talked with the folks at the hospital. It seems to me we're past that point now, and now we're talking of this is really kind of in the model of inform versus uh, us being able to influence the, the process other than give our opinion. And so, I don't know, just being fair to the hospital, which has been a great partner through this process, and I'm absolutely behind everything set up here, uh, but I, I think, too, just being reasonable on what we can expect to influence is going to be really something, and I, I'll look forward to hearing what you have for uh, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for coming and answering our questions. Thank Keeping you. Keeping us updated. Thanks so much. I have something else on this. On, so I, I've got this idea, and, and I'm looking at the city manager. Is there a way to, to uh, give a little goodwill to the crew to let them know that we're very interested in them making progress? Can we perhaps out of, I'm looking at the council here, uh, maybe allocate a portion of the little budget we have to buy them donuts maybe once a week to take it out there as, as a sign of goodwill? I mean, let, let them know. You know, we're supportive, and, and I agree with what uh, Council Member Edgar says. I don't want to help the hospital spend their money. They've already negotiated the contract. That's not what we want, but we want to, you know, certainly remove any objections from the cities. You know, whatever obstacles you have that you need the city, you got to call them up. You got he's the guy to call if you can't get answers from them, and we want to get right on it because, you know, we're, we're committed to helping you early. Uh, you know, finish early as as you can as well. But any goodwill we can buy, I'd like to, you know, at the support of the council, we can look at that. Just yeah, we will do everything that we can to be supportive, and are, are, we're working with the hospital staff and the marketing firm and construction company, and yeah. we'll. Get out there and be very proactive with Thank it. You. Do everything that we can to bring that time period down as well. Great. I want some of that donut action. So when we get going, I'm going to go, Dean, because I haven't gone yet, and then I'm going to wrap it up because we're uh, getting behind here. Uh, the things that I would like to ask is that when this project is happening, obviously apartment row, the streets run parallel with Gatella. I, I imagine they're going to uh, experience a high volume of cut through traffic. So if we can have the um, police department be extra aware of that so that we can maybe have the patrols a little bit more um, thorough in that area during the peak hours of time just to protect the kids that play out there. I don't want to see any children being harmed. And then also, I will bring this up, I brought it up initially, I believe that those two lights so close together are unnecessary. You've got the, the light at Cherry already, you're going to put a light at Kaler. We're already so congested on Catella with pass-through traffic. We don't have an off-ramp at Cerritos yet, and I know there are several people that come through for Garden Grove and Cypress, and I just would like to ask the hospital to consider, I know you're already in your uh, plans and you're moving forward with them, but please take that into consideration because I believe that it's a negative impact on this community. And, uh, and with that, I'll go ahead and bring it back to the council. We're going to move on to, oh, I'm sorry, Dean, you had one more thing you wanted no, to say? I was just going to say the comment was made that it's the hospital's money, it's the city's street. And so we do have control mechanisms from that standpoint. I think we need to relook at the idea of the no parking along because whatever we can do to expedite movement of traffic east and west, uh, we need to look at during this period of time. Uh, the comment was made, three lanes, three lanes back up. You take one of those away and you're, you're going to have a longer backup. That's why I'm encouraging anybody Businesses, you said there's a thousand businesses that you're going to go talk to along Catella. Within a thousand feet of either side. Okay. Whatever. When you go talk to those businesses, the same thing needs to apply. 
because whether they adjust their schedules from the standpoint of when personnel come in and personnel leave, um, those are flexible scheduling. We've been through similar things when the Olympics were in Los Angeles and they got trucks to stop uh, delivering during certain hours. We need to hear from motorists that are using this what the problems are so that you guys can be on top of looking at alternatives and being flexible enough to make changes to help expedite this process getting through. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dean's request was to see if we use that third lane. Uh, Dave, I don't know how um, logical this would be, but if we're going to look into something like that and you believe that there is a safety concern, is there the potential to have uh, additional striping put in just temporarily so that the lanes are very clear. I mean, if you're going to take out that first lane and you have two other lanes, but then we're going to extend it by using the parking, I think, like you said, we could get into some problems. So if we could just look at that, if we're going to be even entertaining that, I'd like to see some kind of permanent striping for the duration of the uh, of the work that's going to be done. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on. Excuse to me, uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, when was this contract entered into? Contract? Yes, with you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, the prime contract? The contract to do the street work that we're talking about right now. Snyder Langston was contracted to do the work last year. The overall, I mean, that included the, tilt, the office building, the parking structure, the site work, the off-site improvements, the entire package. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. Oral communications. At this time, anyone, indiv any individual in the audience may come forward to speak on any item within the subject jurisdiction of the City Council. Remarks are to be limited to not more than five minutes per speaker. And what I'd like to say, uh, if you're going to speak on an agenda item later, you are only allowed three minutes to speak. So if you have something more important to say than just those three minutes, please speak now instead of the time of the uh, agenda item. Okay, I'm opening oral communications. We have a card from uh, Run Seal Beach. Seth, can you come forward, please? Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Members of Council, staff, Seth Eaker, Run Seal Beach, it's a pleasure to be before you. Guess what? It's time for the 40th annual Run Seal Beach. Great. Uh, it's really exciting. It's uh, the single largest fundraiser, I think, of its, uh, of its type in our unified school district. It uh, has represented, we crossed the million dollar threshold wow. uh, last, uh, last year. That was pretty exciting. And uh, a lot of our sponsors and runners and participants and youth are all key to the success of this run. Uh, the city is key uh, to this run. And we want to thank you and acknowledge you um, and invite you to participate. So come on and register online, runsealbeach.com. I can tell you right now there are already 4,300 people registered for the run. The, ch uh, the kids 1K fun run, we're going to cap at 400 kids, 10 and under, because we're maxing out. So we want to make sure it's a safe, right. sane experience for those kids and the about 100 volunteers that try to manage those kids. Um, and in addition, uh, we cap the runners, too, at about 5,600. So, uh, Councilman Edgar, if you don't have your bib yet, you need to sign up for that. We've seen you every year, I think. He's already got to be for the three races. Very good, very good. Um, and uh, also, while I'm up here, I did want to acknowledge that it really is terrific, the success that Race on the Base um, had. It's nice to have a sister race and a sister partner um, with our run. It's uh, fantastic, and it shows the synergy in our community. Uh, with that, in addition to talking about Run Seal Beach, our 40th Ruby anniversary, oh, I forgot, there's a special gift. Everybody always asks, um, is there a finisher's medal? And we don't have a finisher's medal this year, but we have something unique and different because it's our 40th Ruby anniversary. And I can't tell you what it is, but everybody's going to get one. So you definitely want to be in on this race. Um, I did want to just take a moment to address discussion item 9A, uh, the Sugar Beet Festival. The reason for that is, not only am I on the board of Run Seal Beach, I'm also a business owner in Los Alamitos at 10682 Los Alamitos Boulevard with Beach Fitness Strength and Conditioning. So it's great to be part of the community as a business owner as well and in the fitness sector. And we were one of the obstacle sponsors last year at the Sugar Town Challenge. It was awesome. awesome. Uh, I think I saw all of you there. Uh, it really was a spectacular event. And it's another example of community coming together 
And whatever we can do as a unified school district, I really believe deeply in partnership. And uh, Councilmember Gross and I serve on the Legislative Action Committee of West Orange County, and I'm his co-chair. So I really believe in the synergies that happen between our communities. Um, this is a good event, and whatever we can do to support it, I would encourage you to do as a business owner, as one of the participants and obstacle contributors. So thank you, and don't forget, sign up, runsealbeach.com tonight. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? Would you come forward, please? Dave, if you'll state your name for the record. Uh, Dave Emerson. Um, I came to speak on one thing, but I want to touch on a second. Uh, I live in suburbia, Los Al resident, for 25-some years. Um, we've had a local blog, the first one and only one that's devoted to Los Alamitos for some time now, uh, Let's Fix Los Al .com. And for the last few years, people have been scratching their heads about the name. <laughs> and after last year, we, which is mainly me, decided last year the council was beautiful. <coughs> I want to thank each one of you. You worked together. You had four major appointments and you managed to come out with outstanding people from everything I've heard for each of the four appointments and you managed to come together unanimously on each of the four and that's a huge workload and I just think that's huge and seemed to me like Los Al was fixed so I kicked it around with my staff of about six people that all volunteer on the thing and we all thought that was a good idea and so we have implemented a change if you go to letsfixlosal.com right now for several reasons uh, you're going to get a not operable page. We're working on that. But uh, you go to losalnews.com. We've transferred all the archives. Everything's there. Uh, we tried to maintain a positive attitude last year. I'm encouraging staff to do that. Every, every author writes for themselves. But uh, losalnews.com and anything the city wants in, they can send me an email. Uh, anything you want in, all council members and city staff and city residents and city businesses are welcome to submit guest posts. And we'll get them up with the speed of light, provided I can do that. Uh -huh. uh, on traffic, I've been fighting this battle for the last couple of months uh, as a, being a traffic commissioner, switch hats here, uh, we've been aware of what was going on and I really appreciate uh, Councilmember Gross's words and Councilmember Murphy's words. Uh, this, your phones are going to ring and my phones are going to ring and everyone in my neighborhood knows I'm on the traffic commission and I'm not going to get much sleep for those seven <laughs> weeks, frankly. Uh, I think Mr. Murphy's math is accurate and I think Mr. Gross's uh, analysis is accurate. I think we need to go to three lanes during rush hours. Ain't nobody driving 45 at rush hour. I think we need to cone that, and then just like Carson in Long Beach, uh, yeah, we're going to have a little swerve, but uh, the curbside lanes are only during peak hours. I wish this was being done during the summer. I've pushed for that, but the scheduling, for some reason, with the hospital didn't work out. I think if we pretty much had, we don't close Catella, for more than a week at a time, except during the summer, we could have solved a lot here. Uh, uh, the hospital, I'm told, uh, was open to, the hospital across the street, the medical center was open to 24 hours a day construction. And they're the ones most affected, and certainly the hospital on the other side of the street would be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what sort of concessions, or I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of a bump, obviously, in, in pricing, and this should have been brought up a long time ago, in my opinion. and, and I think that was a failure on our part, certainly, but I think the hospital, when we were putting the whole package together, would have been happy to do that because this is, this is a win-win for everyone and it's a lose-lose for everyone every single day that's jammed. I just remind you that when we had the island finally constructed here between Blockbuster and the new drugstore, that was supposed to take four weeks, it was done in two weeks. The city managed the construction. This is the same thing, but a lot longer. It may be a little more complex. They were only working five days a week, eight hours on that. I think the difference was partly personnel and just throwing more people during the hours you are working. But I think if you went for two shifts, uh, I, I agree we should get as close to getting this thing done as quickly as we can. And I think if we don't, I know I'm going to get yelled at as a traffic commissioner. And I think the hospital's going to get some bad publicity, and I think every one of you are going to get phone calls. I think uh, 
Council Member Gross hit the nail on the head. And I experience as a traffic commissioner is showing. I thank you that you feel my pain, and I hope that staff and council can and, and the contractor can solve it working together. Thank I you. Am. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Real, real quick, Dave, I have a, a comment. Um, I, I don't like the shirt you're wearing, but uh, congratulations to you. Me <laughs> neither, actually. You know, it was green or UCLA. Unfortunately, yeah, that, we that have to that off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you want, just keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, Gina. Hi, Mayor and uh, City Council members. For those that don't know me, my name is Gina Beery, and I have the honor of serving the city and the city council members as a traffic commissioner. And every every time I come, there's always something traffic related to just you know uh, engage in. So I also mirror generally uh, Dave's. Mr. Emerson's sentiments, but I'm actually here tonight because I'm on the board of directors of the Youth Center in Los Alamitos, and so I just wanted to uh, give you guys some information. If I could pass this along to Mr. Um, just wanted to make you guys aware of it and invite you, and so I've pro there's some information in there about it so that you're aware, and um, three dates to you know mark on your calendars if you would honor us with your presence. There is the kickoff event, which is Tuesday, April 1st at 7 p.m., and that's at the Youth Center, just right next door. And then Tuesday, April 8th at 6.15 p.m., it's the Chamber Mixer, which it's like a fun like baked potato night and it's all fun all the time but anyway uh then the last the closing like celebration and award ceremony is going to be tuesday april 29th at 7 p.m and so uh, we hope that you can make it to any of those and and be a part of our uh 2014 campaign thank That's you it. thank you anyone have any questions for gina before she walks away all right are weren't you going to be doing some fundraising Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you yeah. can tell the community a little bit about that, what you're looking for. and. Oh, sure. Yeah, just um, any, any little bit. I mean, one of the things that our executive director, Lena, likes to say is like a cup of coffee every day kind of thing. Anything that anyone can do to support the youth. And um, we really believe in our program. And I think we're the, the longest running nonprofit in Los Alamitos. I think I have that. Congratulations. That's Thanks. awesome. Thank you very much. It's, I don't see them in here. Are they, could you give us the dates one more time, please? Oh, sure, yes. Um, it's the kickoff event is going to be Tuesday, April 1st at 7 p.m. And then the chamber mixer is going to be Tuesday, April 8th at 6.15 p.m. And then the celebration and award ceremony is going to be Tuesday, April 29th at 7 p.m. And then also important to note is every Tuesday in the month of April, we have like a, an accounting and like a, you know, a, a thing that we throw and there's always free food and stuff like that. But those are, you know, our three like big ones. Great. So anyone who can attend the events can still make a donation and it goes to the youth center and it's used for all different kinds of things. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Great. Yes, well, thank okay. you so much, Gina. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? One more speaker. Please state your name for the record. J.M. Ivler. Um, <clears throat> this week, I was um, explaining to my 14-year-old son the concept of responsibility. <laughs> that um, you're responsible for your actions. And in this discussion, I used various examples. One of the examples was the gentleman who did our streets, did them wrong, and had to come back and fix them. He was responsible for his actions. And I flash back to your last meeting last month, where I heard one horror story after another of our former city attorney, that um, goes on top of other things that I'm aware of, like changing minutes of the meeting and changing a vote and other things that just weren't done right. And I have to wonder why I'm not seeing anything coming forward from this city council to hold our city attorney responsible. Um, you're going to be discussing an item tonight, which I'll be back for, which was money paid to a city attorney to do something, and she chose not to do it even after getting direct orders from the city council to do it. We, we, we continually paid money for services we didn't get. I'm being told we don't have money for a phone system. We don't have money to help the people behind the high school. We don't have money for this. We don't have money for that. Oh, we paid a lot of money for services we didn't receive or that were poorly redone and questionable. 
And I would like to see us discussing what we're going to do about it. How are we going to hold that contractor? Because that was a contract between us and a law firm. How are we going to hold them responsible for the work that they did? How can I turn to my kid and say, yeah, we hold people responsible? When generally, when I hear something come up like this, I hear, well, that was in the past. Let's forget that, because we really don't want to open that can of worms. No, that's called not holding somebody responsible for their actions. And I really would like to know what my city is going to do to hold the person who didn't do their job well responsible for not doing their job. If we didn't get the services we paid for, the least we should be doing is getting our money back. Because we need that money here in Los Al for everything from a phone system to helping our residents who live behind the high school who are looking for our city to help them. And I don't want to hear us telling them we don't have the money because we paid an attorney who didn't do her job. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be back when the next item comes. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, we'll close oral communications and move on to item 7, register of major expenditures. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to move them. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Roll call vote, I'm sorry. Councilmember Edgar? Aye. Councilmember Gross? Aye. Councilmember Kusumoto? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Murphy? Aye. Mayor Graham Mejia? Aye. Moving on to the consent calendar. All consent calendar items may be acted upon in one motion unless a council member requests a separate action on a specific item. Are there any items that the council would like to pull? I'd like to pull D, please. D. Anything else? A motion to uh, move the remainder? Move the balance. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion <coughs> passes. We'll go on to uh, item D, and could we get a very quick staff report on that? Thank you, Mayor and City Council. This item is a proposed resolution to designate the city manager as the city treasurer. We, we currently have a, a vacant administrative services director position uh, that is being filled on an interim basis. Uh, Glenn Steinbrink is fulfilling those duties as the interim director of administrative services uh, on a part-time basis. And this is um, our last interim finance director just left the city, Linda Magnuson, and she had previously been designated as the treasurer. So this is to um, redesignate a position in the city, and in this case, the city manager as the treasurer at this point. I know that Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy had some questions about this one. Great. We'll bring it back to the Council. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy? Yes. You know, it's really basic accounting internal control. <coughs> to spread the work over as many people as possible. And that's really what I'm questioning here. Linda used to do the job. And I just think from an internal control review and perspective, wouldn't we be better off if Glenn took over? And that way, you can't take the whole Treasury home with just one signature? We can, we can do that. Um, we looked into that uh, in terms of our municipal code. And can we can either have the city manager appointed and city manager designate a person or um, if there is any concern about separating things out, actually designating the interim director of administrative services as the treasurer, that's that would be fine and acceptable and appropriate. There is a, I mean, we are very small, so it's it's difficult oftentimes, and you deal with the auditing firm to ensure that there are sufficient internal controls, and that's sometimes very difficult to. It do is hard in a small, small group, definitely, but it just it just seems that Linda was doing it before. And it created a little bit of separation. And personally, I would, I would have trouble having a designee who then we really don't know who it is. That, that would bother me. So I would just prefer to substitute uh, Glenn's name for yours in the resolution, if that's okay with my colleagues, and, and just go as how we had it before. Yeah, that's fine. And um, what we would do then is if and when we can um, hire a permanent director of administrative services, we would bring that person back and designate the permanent position Thank at you. that time. Okay, just a quick question before we come to the council members. Uh, historically, in the past, we have used our city manager as as the treasurer, correct? 
I, I believe so. I mean, in the history, I, I believe that the city manager and, and the administrative services director and the finance director, I think at various positions, have been appointed as the treasurer in the past. Great. I just wanted that information before we brought it back for questions. So uh, I know, Councilmember Gross, you had a question? I just was going to say uh, for Councilmember, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. It's Councilman you today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That that's been a thing that's been has been done in the past routinely. You've got a part-time person that's not here on around the clock, or I mean a regular work schedule. Um, this is an interim thing until we get that position filled. So, me personally, I would feel more comfortable with a staff member that's here on a regular basis being held accountable uh, in that particular process. And and just for reference purposes. It, We've done that in the past. We did discover, however, that at one point we hadn't changed to anybody, and the person that was on the position uh, wasn't here at all. So I commend staff for at least staying on top of this this time and not waiting until we uh, found out later that we didn't have a city treasurer. So. Okay. Does anybody Thank have anything you. new to add? Other? Okay. Uh, it, you know, <coughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, just looking at why do we have to appoint this, I think that uh, the ad hoc committee, Richard and myself, or the budget uh, committee, have been really focused on uh, looking at restructuring our idle investments of about $10 million within the city. Okay. Um, the treasurer function for the city is the one that actually administers that as a role. And so without having somebody assigned and delegated to that, uh, we have limited amount of opportunity to propose and have somebody own it when we actually get to present it back as the ad hoc committee back to the city council. So, um, yeah, e either way, I, I will say historically, because I've been here for a while, we, we definitely have usually tried to go with the most stable person in the stable. So, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. Council and, and if I can, I know I, I brought this issue up uh, a couple years ago when we had uh, City Manager uh, Angie Avery, and it sort of just came up as, as a consent item, and I did question it. So, um, at that point in time, we did appoint Angie as the uh, treasurer, but I think there was an alternative solution where we were looking at Chief uh, Mattern as the treasurer. So maybe, um, Mayor Pro Tem Murphy, if we can look at that, because we have someone here who's, uh, you know, someone that's here 40 hours per week and then some, and I don't know if it's amenable to the uh, staff, to uh, Brett, but, but that might be a better solution in, instead of a, uh, because uh, Glenn's here two days a week, is that typically it? So Yes. So I, e either way, I'm good, but, but I, understand, I understand your concern. Besides the internal control concern, I mean, to me, as Dean stated, we had somebody who was in the job and we didn't even know they were gone. So the importance of having a treasurer here on a regular basis, I don't think, I think if they came once a month, it'd be sufficient. And they're going to be here more, much more than that. Uh, I, would, I would hate to look back and say we should have done, we should have increased our internal, internal control. By the time we know we should have, it's too late. Okay. But but I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The the position of treasurer uh, also deals with the investment, and then there's a bond that goes along with uh, a bonding that goes along with that. So I imagine that would be something that would need to factor into that uh, as well, right? The treasurer, de the, there is a requirement for the treasurer designated per position to be bonded as well. I mean, there, okay. there's a variety of positions in the code that are required to be bonded. The, in terms of the logistics of it, that we. Um, we do have a portfolio that we don't have to make investments every day, so it could be done with a part-time director of administrative services logistically, just to you know, let the council know that. So, so back to you, what, what would your preference be then? Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I, I mean, if, if, if it's between the police, and I think <laughs> looking over at the police chief, if it's between the police chief doing it and the interim director of administrative services, I think because the finance function fits under the city manager, I would be more comfortable having okay. it as the interim director of okay. administrative services I no now and then reappointing the permanent position down okay. the line. Yeah, I have no objections. So okay, I so I'll go ahead with my round real quick. Uh, would you prefer to have it be you than the part-time person? And if so, why would that be? Uh, to, I don't, whatever the no preference. council's preference is on that, okay. either one we can work with. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. I'll support Councilmember Murphy's or Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. I had to do it. I was the only one that left that didn't do it. Uh, so if we want to appoint as the interim, and as long as there's no legal issue with uh, that power being in a contract hire, then I would support that as a motion. Any second? There is no legal issue. Okay. okay, great. So I'll go ahead and second, uh, I guess, uh, Councilmember Ager's motion. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. All right. We are going to uh, have a situation where Councilmember Edgar, you're going to have to step away in about uh, 15 minutes. You so know what? I'll stay. I, I just want to make sure we go through everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, because uh, Councilmember so. Kuzumoto is comfortable with pulling the item regarding him, so that we could get through the uh, 9A. Okay. Would you I, like? And I'd like to go to close because we, we need you in close session. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to um, continue item 9B to the next regular meeting in the interest of time. And we'll go ahead and move on to the discussion items for 9A, Sugar Beet Festival 5K Sugar Town Challenge. Staff report, please. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. This item is before you. We have the Sugar Beet Festival. We've had the uh, organizers and they are in the audience tonight. And uh, they come before you a couple of different times during public comment to give you updates on the upcoming Sugar Beet Festival for 2014, which is scheduled to take place on June 7th. And staff has also met with the organizers several times. And we've given them, based on their proposal, the estimated costs of what would be required and the estimated tasks of what would be required to put the event together. And we've included that in the staff report. <coughs> They also have, on March 10th, they sent an email over to our Director of Community Services and Recreation, Corey Lakin, with a request to consider that the council either waive some fees or co-sponsor the event. And so as a result, we've, we're bringing this back to the council, the full council for consideration. And we've laid out a number of options in the staff report. And I will turn it over at this time to Corey to go over the options that are included in the staff report and we can answer any questions that, as I said, Larry Strothers and Diana Hill are both here in the audience and Corey and I, we could answer questions for the council and then we're looking for direction at the end of this. So Corey will take over from here. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, this staff report provides uh, you with uh, options uh, on uh, uh, the city's assistance of the second annual uh, Sugar Beet Festival 5K-ish Sugar Town Challenge uh, that's scheduled to be held on Saturday, June the 7th. Uh, there are uh, a total of 10 options uh, listed or recommendations that allow you to uh, pick and choose from, uh, consider and authorize any combination of those or, or anything not listed as well. Um, I, I'm going to go over uh, briefly uh, a, a number of the things that are in the staff report that are part of the recommendations and, and uh, like the city manager said, if you have any questions at that point, uh, I'd be happy to answer any of those or, or turn it over to the uh, coordinators. Um, last year was the first ever uh, uh, Sugar Beet Festival and uh, Sugar Town Challenge. Uh, it was held last July. The second annual is coming up. Uh, they are looking to, the organizer looking to have the festival at the shops at Rossmore and Seal Beach this year. Uh, however, uh, continue to have the uh, Sugar Town Challenge, the run portion, um, uh, run through the, uh, the, the streets of, of Old Town and through several of the businesses in that area. Uh, some of, of the uh, requests that were uh, provided in the uh, the May 10th uh, email and, and some previous discussions would be the opportunity for the Sugar Beet Festival and their sponsoring nonprofit CSMP um, wishes to uh, receive any waived fees or uh, co-sponsorship that the council would be interested in uh, in partnering with. Uh, they don't want to receive any special consideration that hasn't already been. Uh, uh, um, held in the uh, in the past um, and uh, uh, one of their specific requests is is that uh, the council consider waiving uh, what they deem as uh, soft fees that would include items like the special event permit and the traffic plan uh, that uh, are two hundred and fifty dollars and four hundred and seventy five dollars respectively another option is to co-sponsor the uh, Sugar Town Challenge, again, just the run portion of uh, the event where the city could elect to uh, donate any of the fees, uh, including the special event per 
permit, the traffic review plan, police department staffing, and the, uh, uh, there's several different options with the general liability insurance. So the police department, the fees associated with that, with covering the event for approximately four hours, um, would be about $550 to $650. That does range based upon uh, which officers are assigned to that. The special event permit, permit fee is a typical permit uh, that gets routed around to all the departments within the city. Uh, that permit costs about $250. Uh, with that, there are some caveats, including requirement of a traffic plan and event layout, uh, which they have agreed to do and they've done in the past. Um, but as a part of that, uh, the city does require insurance. Um, the, the Sugar Beet Festival, last time I spoke with Larry, was uh, they weren't quite sure where they were going to go with the insurance at the time because they do need insurance for the festival portion as well. Uh, however, if they wanted to uh, purchase um, special event insurance through Alliant Insurance Services, who we work with for uh, several different events and pro programs as a tenant user, they have that option um, at just under $300. Um, the city engineer and the traffic engineer uh, need to review the traffic plan. Uh, although the, the plan um, is, is, not, is, is minimal changes from last year, there are some changes that uh, uh, would review uh, both of the contractors to review that at a cost of $475. And getting back to the insurance and risk management, um, there, there's basically two options or multiple options. Sugar Beet Festival can go and purchase their own insurance from a reputable company and uh, meet the, the minimum requirements that the city would uh, would ask them to meet. Um, they can purchase the insurance through Alliant Insurance Services, a $2 million general liability insurance costs just under $300. Would the city be interested in co-sponsoring and provide their own general liability insurance as a part of this? Obviously, that means that the city assumes liability for any, any items that take place during the event, whether on public or private property, based upon you know, any uh, um, legal uh, documents or paperwork that's, that's assigned. Um, but the city can also pur purchase additional um, liability coverage, a $2 million policy. The price of that is just under $1,900. So it does um, go up uh, a, a, a significant amount where the city to take out an additional um, policy. Uh, past practices do include the city has waived fees for the Wings, Wheels, and Rotors event in the past um, and has co-sponsored the Winter Wonderland uh, at the Plaza event in the past. Uh, for Wings, Wheels, and Rotors, the, the uh, um, Chamber of Commerce has their own insurance. Um, they do not need to purchase any ad additional uh, insurance for the sit through the city because it does not take place um, in the city's jurisdiction. It's on the Joint Forces training base, therefore not on city property. Um, and the uh, the Winter Wonderland event I is a um, uh, a co-sponsored event, but it's co-planned, co-produced, and co-sponsored by the city and the chamber, and all uh, direct costs are reimbursed through sponsorships, uh, vendor fees, in including the staffing and, and, and overtime fees for that. Um, were there to be a co-sponsorship, we would definitely uh, enter into a co-sponsorship agreement with the Sugar Beet Festival. Um, listed a number of different items that may be included in that. Obviously, we haven't gone down that road yet pending tonight. Uh, if you uh, uh, deem that, that uh, the path, then we would definitely look into that. Um, and uh, uh, again, the, the bottom line, the, f the fiscal impact, if the city does nothing and allows the Sugar Beet Festival just to uh, go about their business, uh, then the, the price that would be owed to the city <coughs> would be $1,375, and then they would be required to uh, secure insurance at either the price of 292 or purchase their own through an outside vendor. Uh, should the city decide to co-sponsor, um, it can go, uh, you, the city council can decide whether to waive uh, one or all fees, uh, donate any number of, uh, of uh, services to the Sugar Beet Festival, and uh, deem at that time that uh, whether the city wants to absorb with their general liability insurance or pur purchase any additional liability insurance. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to you, Mayor, and, and if you have any questions, we have happy to Great. What I'd like to ask, if the council will allow, I'd like to have uh, Larry Strothers come up and really elaborate on what they would like to ask of us instead of us going through all of this and maybe those are things that he's not interested in. Is that okay with the council? Great. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for coming. Hi. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, 
Madam Mayor and Emperor Murphy. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> give you a little if more. Somebody remembered, there, right? Um, no, thank you for bringing the item forward. It's, um, I'll, it's kind of confusing because I'm not quite sure what we actually wanted out of this because a couple things have changed and a lot of it is in, in, in play. But the money has never been the real issue. It was almost like the buy-in from the city, just the, the support, the, buy, you know, the backing. Mm -hmm. We have to get our own insurance anyway. We have to get the full thing. And I, I didn't bring it up before, and that was my mistake. I remember last year, this, uh, the city's uh, insurance person made us get far above the special event insurance. Right. So that's kind of what we were talking about before. That's the, the number that was kind of in play. Uh, it ended up not being that big of a deal. The insurance, like I said, I think ultimately we have to get our own insurance. That's, you know, that's kind of off the table in, in, in my guess. Um, but, I, you know, what was important is that's a buy-in from the city, a gesture that, you know, we're really behind this event, I think. You know, because it kind of started with Angie. Mm -hmm. and she and I were sitting down, and he said, yeah, we're looking for an event for the city. And so, um, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job in the last year, the event was a fun event for the community. It was good for the business, for the local nonprofits, and promoting the local businesses. Uh, it was an event which raised a lot of money. You know, I don't have an exact number in front of me, don't quote it, but I believe that figure we turned over to you, the paperwork, was like mm -hmm. over $6,000 that went to over 20 different nonprofits in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just Los Alamitos. There was some, you know, from Lakewood. There was some from uh, Long Beach. There was one from Carson, I know. Um, you know, and there was some from Los Alamitos in the high school and, you know, a lot of groups like that, Weaver School. Um, it was also an event which I was looking back in comparison, it was better in terms of revenues than the first year of the Taste for Los Al. Oh. And that event, which by the way, our Los Al is kind of taking over this event. We've kind of, we're going to, after the event, we're going to fold up uh, the CSMP and our Los Al will be assuming all its assets and, uh, you know, responsibilities. But it was better than the first year of the Taste for Los Al. And I know we had to figure, we just did a presentation at the board last week, but when we total up all the money, that event has grown, so we've given over $1.8 million to all the local high school groups, and there's a couple others we let participate there if they have something that was involving the, the high school. That's awesome. So that was a really successful event, and I think because this is a bigger scope, we can do the same thing in probably a short amount of time. That's our goal. Um, as I indicated, though, it's like, you know, the money's not the big thing. It's not that much. I'm never going to turn down support. And that's all <coughs> I'm going to get. But, uh, um, you know, if the city, city still wishes to help, you know, the soft fees are money that the city's not actually, it's not actually costing you man hours. It's not actually costing you, to my mind, additional labor. Um, you know, the, the clerk fees, you're still paying the clerks whether they're filling out that form or not. The traffic fees, there's only two changes. I mean, you're moving the, the no parking sign from in front of Nick's to in front of Precious Life, and you move the other one from right by the, uh, the, the medical, uh, uh, the, the hospital, not the hospital, but the medical center right there, mm -hmm. at, uh, Cherry and Florissa, down to uh, right by um, St. Isidore. Those are the only two changes to this the event from last year. So maybe I'm wrong, but I, I can't imagine those fees, you know, you know, being much, being high. <laughs> anyway, what I was looking for, and I think we've talked about this before, but, you know, you wave the soft fees, the power of persuasion from the board, from you guys, that's a valuable asset. Because you've talked to a lot of different people that we don't talk to. Just mention that, hey, this is a great event. You know, that's what I'm talking about in terms of the support. Just the power of persuasion of the council, city employees, and benign marketing. You know, putting a little event up on the, uh, a little thing on the, on the city website and a link. It's, it's been done before. I was on there today and I looked at stuff. You're doing it for classes that are, you know, run by private individuals through the rec center. Mm -hmm. there's a, for Los Al TV, there's a, a link to a, you know, a private website. So it's nothing unusual. It's you know not unprecedented. Because it's, especially because it's election year, I don't want to get into politics in the middle of anything. I don't want any of you guys to get in the middle of anything. So whatever you decide, it's fine with us. The event's going to go on. I think we're all going to have a great time. Um, you know, I look forward to getting a lot of people. You know, we're having it at the shops at Rossmore because there's a lot of more things, just in terms of layout, that are beneficial by that. A lot more parking. We want to come back up here because we have so many of the merchants who participated said it was a lot of fun having us go through their place. Trend has signed on again. We're going to go through CI Solutions, you know, Beach CrossFit, the new place, Snow Biggie, Kidnastics, and Champions Quest, and, and you know, we're hoping to get the new baseball place in. I was talking to them last week. And the archery place was great. Mm -hmm. I just wish he let me know like the day before the event that he's participating instead of that day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was great. And so whatever you guys decide, we look forward to whatever help you provide.
And, but mainly your participation and uh, you know, encouragement and support, is, that's the biggest thing we're looking for. Can I ask you a question? So yeah. when you say uh, involvement, are you looking for a co-sponsorship with the city or is that not anything you're interested in? Um, the reason that came up before was when we got hit with that, uh, you have your joint powers insurance person, mm -hmm. and that number just like really kind of blew me out of the water because I'm used to the numbers for the Taste of Los Al and some other things we've run. And then all of a sudden it went up pretty darn high. You're talking about the insurance for yeah, the, so the liability. Yeah, the joint powers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was kind of blown away, and that's when I kind of had the idea. But then you start shopping around for policies, and sometimes it's not that big of a difference to go from the 2 million aggregate up to 10 million aggregate. I was kind of shocked. So, um, you know, until I know what that number is going to be from the city on what the, you know, the joint powers insurance guy is going to require. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's, that's only applying for the running up here in Los Alamitos. That has nothing to do with what's going down, on, you know, down at the shops. Right. So I... That was a kind of a way of doing it because I, I know that you had co-sponsored the Winter Wonderland. You're closing streets there, and there was no insurance. I don't think you farmed that insurance out. I think it was just assumed underneath that liability. So that was the only reason behind the co-sponsoring. Right. And so is that something you're interested in? Because we're trying to break down this list. We, we asked to have every option available to us, and so there are several. So is co-sponsoring something that you would be interested in, or are you kind of shying away from that now? I would tend to shy away at, you okay. know, right now. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and bring it back. Larry, if you can stay there. I'm going to bring it back to the council. Anyone who would like to speak? Troy? <clears throat> I, it, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to figure out why this is a big deal. Um, I mean, this was a great event last year. Mm -hmm. um, the race was more of a fun race than a competitive race, and that's right. hopefully as we build up more time, we'll actually time in <laughs> to be more competitive. But, but I think, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it's a great thing for the community. Um, you know, and I, I think you're asking for reasonable items. This okay. is a long list, so like Jerry, it was hard for me to decide what was different than, you know, what, what you really wanted versus what all of our options are. Probably the last thing I'll say is I, I've never, from the time I've been on, got in the way of when somebody is actually trying to do something to help the community constructively, I think that, that we should try to get to the extent we can and be helpful. Mm -hmm. I know I push for wings, wheels, and rotors sometimes when we've been on different ends up here. Um, so I just, I'll be consistent and support, you know, to kind of help you guys maintain this and get this thing off the ground. You're in the heavy lift period right now, and uh, hopefully we can be a part of that. Thank you. Richard? No, I'm good. Okay. Anyone else? I'll Councilmember Add some stuff here. The um, the soft items that you talked about, the wave of the special event permit, I, I tend to agree that is soft uh, and something that that the council could consider waiving. And and uh, I don't see this in the same fashion as wings, wheels, and rotors, mainly because that does occur on federal property and the city doesn't have the jurisdiction there. Um, the waiving of the traffic plan review um, is not soft fees because we don't have a traffic engineer on staff. Uh, that's a contracted position from an outside agency. And uh, while, it, while we have the, the value of people being here, it's still a cost to the city regardless of what that individual does. The waiving of uh, police department fees um, again, are not soft fees because we wind up having to put officers on on an overtime basis in order to accommodate this. And right now, um, we're short-staffed uh, from the standpoint of the PD, and it means somebody giving up their off-duty time to come in and do that. And most of the time, they're happy to do it, but there are specific costs that are, are handled by the, the city or that, that the city bears. Um, I didn't ask for any police fees to be waived because I agree with you totally okay. on that. Um, uh, okay, so that's off the, off the table. The, the sponsorship I'm concerned about because um, for two things. One, when it, was, when it was held downtown in Old Town East, there are businesses there that do affect uh, and can be affected by it. Uh, dollar and cents wise, it brings some business in, Hoff's Hut. I'm sure picked up some business in the process. Uh, uh, Nick's place and some of the others around there that uh, take care of, of people during the week uh, probably saw some some increased business. Moving that portion of it 
to the shops at Rossmore actually takes it tax dollar wise, support wise to the city of Seal Beach. And uh, um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that that was the direction that you guys took uh, from this standpoint to, to use your comment of support, meaning, you know, we, we talk it up among city employees. Um, I, I don't see a problem with that, talking it up here from the council. Uh, I think everybody up here is supportive of doing it. But to actually put the city on um, as a, a formal co-sponsor, I have some concerns about that just from the liability standpoint and the relationship. He's aspect. already taken that off the table. These were just options. Dean. No, he said he's, he's talking support if I can finish here. The use of the city's website and, and contractors and things of that nature, um, those are agreements with classes and I don't know what Parks and Recreation does. But I would, I would encourage us as a council to take a look at establishing some type of policy regarding this entire thing. I know there was discussions regarding the, the St. Hedwig's Carnival and what we did there versus what we do other places. And then I can see many of these things continuing to occur. And it would be important that I think we get behind and follow a stable policy from the standpoint of the city moving forward on what we do. And I don't think that can impact or will have an impact one way or another on, on the uh, Sugar Beat Festival itself. I, I think we can easily provide the support that you're looking at. Um, and, and uh, we all get engaged in things and I think doing the same thing, that would be fine. Um, you basically said insurance uh, you're going to get and take care of, so I don't think that's a factor. Um, I, I think we're down to, from, from what I can see here, we're down to the support aspect. I did get a copy that was provided to the uh, city manager of festival expenses, which is not a clear thing from the standpoint of really what the festival did generate income wise. It does show that uh, approximately 10 local nonprofits uh, did receive part of the $5,300 that was written out. Um, I see nine units or nine individual organizations on here that are regular participants in the Taste of La Salle. And my understanding was this was to really focus more on other nonprofits because they have the Taste of La Salle income. All of that said, getting $5,300 back to, to nonprofits within the community, um, I think is a, an admirable effort from the standpoint of your first event. And I, I'm supportive of trying to help the thing grow and, and move forward. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Um, one thing, I didn't, I didn't put down the money, because the profits went to CSMP, and, which is a local nonprofit. And all those profits went for, to pay for the cost of covering the Little League World Series, which basically, you know, we got some sponsors, but we picked up most of the cost of doing that. So uh, it, that's where the more than 6000 6, came from. Can you comment, Larry, since uh, Councilmember Gross brought it up, he talked about you moving the event so that we're not the benefit. Why, why did you end up moving the event? There's a couple reasons. Number one, the space was limiting. If, just by the way the curbs were, the way the, the property boundaries were, the way you put up tents, you're blocking the view of one section, so they felt kind of isolated from certain parts. You know, f where Florista was, there was a lot of stuff there. They couldn't see what was going on down at the far end, and the v people at the far end couldn't see what's down. So we're just playing with a lot of different things, and you couldn't do it there. Tried to go over to Laurel, but Laurel has some uh, problem out of for a couple different reasons. You couldn't put, like, Southland's our major sponsor. They want to bring out cars. We couldn't put the cars on the grass. Couldn't put a stage that's fairly heavy on, on the new grass there. It's totally understandable. Parking is also an issue. And so the shops liked the event. They participated in it last year. They had some runners who participated in it. And we obviously have a good relationship with them from doing the Taste of Los Al uh, for a number of years. And they said, we would love, we're looking to do something. This would be great for us. So they've been really supportive. Um, you know, they're also acting to get sponsors for us as well. Um, I'd like to touch on one thing. You mentioned you saw groups who were from the Taste of Los Al. And I think that's really understandable because those are the people who trust us the most. It's not from lack of trying. I mean, we went out to every nonprofit we could find in this area just to make them aware of it. 
a lot of them don't know who we are. Uh -huh. And so the first time you do something, it took us about three years for us to get on the consciousness of the people regarding the taste, and that's the same, you know, timeline we're working here. If you know of nonprofits that want to participate, please have them get in touch with us because that is the goal, to so be something that's, you know, different. So. Yeah, and, and that was what I understood with your project last year was that, that the, the booster groups and the athletic events have their successful program going and it's not open as a general rule to the to the We Cares and, and uh, CASA and some of these others that are in the area. Um, so that was what I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this was to try and give something new to those nonprofits. So. Well, but it's open to any nonprofit, and all those groups are nonprofits. So you, I don't think you can say, it's easy to say we're only keeping the high school groups. It's, it's kind of tough to make that call. No, you can't do this one because you're in a school. I, I think politically that's. <laughs> Not the best public relations move I could make. Yeah, but all right. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we we waive numbers two and three, don't waive number four, and agree that we will do our best to support this, to, to support the the Sugar Beet Festival as we did last year. I'll all second. right. Uh, well, there's a couple of us that haven't had an opportunity to speak. Is was that a second? Yeah. Right? Please. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Kuzumoto. Well, I, I'd like to then. Uh, I guess I'll offer a, a substitute motion, if I may. And and it really kind of, the, the questions I wanted to ask of, of staff. I know that um, when I've reviewed the um, wings, wheels, and rotors, uh, I noted there were certain levels of expenses that we've incurred as a city. Now, understandably, I I, I do recognize it is not on uh, city property; it's not on public land. But but when we have staff going on to the base to collect trash. Um, and we're paying them, I, I think there's a level of support that we do provide. So um, whereas that is not soft money, that's hard money, much like the police and, and um, the engineer, the traffic engineer that we hire. So, so I think the support we can probably offer on, on, the, on the soft monies uh, here and, and perhaps even the police department, we might be able to do a bit more. So my, my motion will be that we, we look at how we can cover the fees that, w that would be incurred by the organization, um, perhaps up to the level of which we've incurred uh, cost on wings, wheels, and rotors. And then the other part of it is that we can look at um, in the, um, the business and residential rebate program, we underran that. We, we allocated uh, a fairly substantial amount of money. There is a, some money there that was not tapped into, and perhaps that would be a source of funds that we can look to shuffle around. And then the, the last thing, um, that we can look at, uh, and, and uh, Corey, I'm sorry to do this to you, but uh, on, on the endeavors you've undertaken, you, you've uh, end up, you know, pulling in money. Is there some portion of that that could be allocated to these soft fees? I don't know how you do it internally uh, to the city, but that'd be a, a, something we could look at. So anyways, uh, long motion, sorry about that, but really is to, to cover the soft fees, looking at the, the revenue sources that we have, up to including uh, what we've um, uh, compensated the um, wings, wheels, and rotors with the um, support we've provided the uh, chamber. So that would be my substitute motion. All right. And I'll second that. But would you also include uh, not a co-sponsorship in the way of being a true co-sponsor, but have language in a sponsorship where we can advertise on our website? I is that possible, city manager? We, we, if we have language, we can put it on our website. Yeah, we can post something on our website as a, is that, I wrote that down as a soft marketing type. Okay. And that's something we, we could absorb as a cost also. Yeah, I think we can post it. We know, technically, we know how to post things. It's just, it, if we don't have to produce a flyer, producing mm -hmm. a flyer is a cost. Well, I think if we work we with the them. Information right. From the event organizers, then we can post it. Okay. Uh, I, and just in terms of comparison, Corey for the wings, wheels, and rotors, and the costs that have been waived because we have that listed in the past practice. Um, the special events insurance, that was not required there, but that was on the base. This, it, we, would, we would recommend requiring it here because of the use of the public streets. Yeah, so, so let me clarify. That so, is a difference. So, so I would not include the, um, the insurance. Th that I, I, I understand what Mr. Strouther said. They're going to pick that up and cover it. Right. You would yeah. do this normal course. So I think the, the fees that would be paid to the city, I think we have that, that more of that wiggle room. It's not hard cash that we'd be giving out. It'd be fees that we'd be waiving. And we can look at internal sources for that. So that, 
Because he included. I included the four. police. Three. Okay. Four. Yeah. Well, you, well, you didn't monetize it, so thank you. Yeah. Okay. So just for clarification, uh, Council Member Kuzumoto's uh, motion was to include payment of number two, waive the special event permit fee, number three, waive the traffic plan review fees, and number four, waive the police department staffing fees. Uh, that would be the same kind of compensation that we've provided for the Wings, Wheels, and Rotors. And if you'll also include the part of the marketing that we could do via That's our website. Fine. All right, and I seconded that motion. So. Uh, so, so we go with the alternative motion. I'm sorry, the substitute motion first, correct, Carrie? Yes. Okay. If it's agreed to. Well, is that uh, open? Why don't we uh, just talk about it? I, sure. I, I well, seconded a motion, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm ready to have that discussion. All right. Okay. Why don't we start with you, uh, Councilmember Edgar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think uh, we're achieving the objectives. I, you know, I don't know if this is a significant amount of reach over and above where I think directionally Rich and I were going. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, Rich, uh, you made the motion and I'm with well, you on that. Do, do you have any concern with this added portion from your perspective? And I, I would say, again, the police thing, I do consider that commensurate to, I mean, what I said in the very beginning, to what we've done for yeah. Wings, Wheels, and Ritter. So it just seems consistent. So, so I, I, I would be happy to withdraw my substitute motion if, if you, the maker of the original motion, would expand his motion to include <laughs> number number four. Why don't we just approve yours? I think that's easier. If okay, then I, I think we're ahead. done then. Okay. Thank you. Are we still on discussion? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Council Member Gross. Again, I, I don't feel I can support that. Okay. And I don't feel I can support it. It's, it's $1,375 for two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. um, that's significantly less than what wings, wheels, and rotors was involved with from the standpoint of the city because there was uh, public works costs that were involved and there was parks and recreation costs that were involved there was police department costs that were involved and and if I'm not mistaken it was in a, in a much higher uh, quantity than than you're saying in your motion uh -huh. equivalent yeah. to yeah, no, I, you're right and and, I and, and so I, I think we either clear that up, but I'm, I'm uh, still going to push from the standpoint that we need to have a policy discussion because we are setting some precedent in doing this that we need to have an understanding where staff can do it and it doesn't need to come to us each time these kinds of requests come up. Um, it, 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 you know, philosophically, I think it's fine to do what we're doing. There is hard costs that are involved uh, in, in this particular process, and we want to be fair from the standpoint of the event going in. Uh -huh. um, I just feel that at some point we have to have a policy. The same thing occurs from the standpoint of the website. It's not a big deal to, to post a flyer on there. We do that on uh, other things that are involved with the city, whether it's, you know, the, the uh, animal control or things that we contract with. But it would be helpful to have some type of a guideline policy of what that's considered, and then deviations from that could come back to us. Because I don't want to be faced with having to make judgment decisions on each event that occurs within the city. So, so, so Councilmember Gross, I mean, why, why don't we just work towards adding a policy? I don't think you'll find there's pushback there. Mm -hmm. And okay. I mean, if that gets you on board, it'd be nice to be, have it. Like they said, I think they're looking for the council to yeah, have and, unanimous. And, and if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sure, no, regular. So I, I understand what Councilmember Gross is. My, my motion was probably not the best worded because it said up to including, and I think that's, is that the objection? So it is no more than what this, this is. So I would like to either rephrase or withdraw my motion, but um, it, it really is no more than what uh, these fees are. I think yours is just items two, three, and four, four and, right. and uh, Mayor Pro Tem right. Murphy's was two and three. Yeah, that right. That's really the difference. And, and I think Councilmember Gross was, and we'll have another agenda item in the future on the policy yeah. going forward. Well, and can I ask, too, um, my, in, my reason for bringing this forward was because they are a brand new event, and can we make a commitment? I have been in opposition to the Wings, Wheels, and Rotors continuing to receive money in the past, and that's because they were able to give a significant amount of money to the MWR, which we support 100%. But it's hard to justify to the community, you know, we're giving them $6,000 in in-kind services, and then they're giving the money to MWR. So what I would like to see 
if we could get support uh, for a certain amount of years just to help this event get off the ground and then past that point we're not looking to fund it ongoing and where you and I have had that uh, discussion I don't know if it's under the guise of what we have here but I'd like to see they've had their first year I'd like to support them uh, at least for three to five years if if we're able to do that within this agenda item city city attorney can we do that um, the agenda item is just for this year okay Suggest the policy in the budget. Okay. All right, great. So we oh. have a motion to. Yeah. And Wendy, did you catch the, the revision to that? Not up to including, but uh, at the at th two, two, three, and four, just wave, wave those fees. And as a follow up, a policy discussion in the future. So, and we could do that either through the budget process right. or, you know, bring, ideally, I think, um, bring a list of uh, annual events, mm -hmm. possibly at one time for a discussion, incorporate that into a policy discussion we have different types of events we have co-sponsored events and mm -hmm. we have events that stand alone where the city is just supporting so we could bring a list back and it would be a benefit in the future to identify which ones get funded and which ones don't right we well I think that we need to show parity across the board we can't be supporting one group and then not supporting another that's why I think the policy is so important so uh, I seconded the motion and if if you'd like we'll go ahead and take a vote can we uh, do a poll for this one, Wendy? We'll I'm sorry, we'll call vote, not poll. So the motion is to support waiving um, items two, three, and four with a policy on special events to come back in the future and support for putting the item on the website. That's correct. Uh, Councilmember Edgar. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Gross. Aye. Councilmember Kusumoto. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Murphy. No. Mayor Graham Mejia. Aye. All right, motion passes. Thanks. So, Larry, we would hope that moving forward we can work with staff to find a way to bring your event, if it's able to fit within our community, back to Los Alamitos. I think it was really great having it here. It's unfortunate some of the steps that happened this time that's led you to over to uh, the Rossmore Center, but for myself, we would like to see it uh, back here in Los Al. Well, I can tell you I've already gotten a lot of pushback from runners uh, yeah. so who enjoyed the, uh, the run. Absolutely. Well, and it just makes more sense. Instead of you having to bus people from the Rossmore Center over to do the race and then bus them back, I think that we need to work closely with staff and the council and your, your group to uh, find a location here that might be beneficial for well, you. We look forward to that, but when they are bused, they will be on a party bus. They will be fun. Oh. So. <laughs> well, now I'm for sure going to register. So, All right, All right Larry, thanks right. so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Okay. All right, we've gone ahead and continued uh, item 9B. And so now we're going to be recessing into. Oh, we got item oh let me see. Oh. Sorry about that, guys. All right. Item 10 Mayor and Council Initiated Business. Anyone who'd like to go first? Warren? Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, um, uh, I had a chance to, um, uh, as far as the, um, re read some of the minutes, um, the uh, LATV three minutes uh, came to my attention and a member of the community had brought something up in the oral communications there and, and uh, also a commissioner. I, and I, I do want the, I guess the council here to consider this, but in the, the paying of uh, those uh, uh, things that we broadcast, like the State of the City, the um, um, the Fourth of July spectacular, those, those type of events. I guess the, the the question from the member of the public is, um, uh, why is that coming out of LATV three budget? We know that that's kind of shrinking. So, uh, I think City Manager, you're looking at that as part of the um, LATV three commission, correct? Where, where the money yeah. goes and where it comes from. This one. It's been. It's definitely being discussed. I mean, we're the last two meetings with the Cable Commission. The commission is trying to get a handle on all of the functions that take place within okay. LATV, and it's it's a, you know it's a part at a time, and okay. it's going to take time to develop that. But that events are part of that. Okay, how so they're funded, how much are funded, how much is available. So it would be, I guess, something that they would look at and then uh, make a recommendation to us as far as. Um, how they would want to see the sources of funding. That's where I'd like okay. to see it go. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So I, I'm interested in that when, when it is ready to come forward because um, I, I tend to agree with the comments that I saw. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask the, uh, the council here is there's an upcoming uh, Southern California Association of Governments conference 
and I, I am the delegate, so I, I, I guess, uh, city clerk, is it kind of an automatic thing to, to go as far as the, it's a, what, two-day conference? I know I went last year, but. Um, it's the local conference, right? It's the one over in, um, I don't know where it is, uh, Palm Desert or something like that. But it's yeah. included in the um, council budget. Okay, so there's no need to bring it up here for discussion? Um, it's advised that you let the council know that you'll be attending, but we can, budgeting it doesn't need to be okay. voted so, on. So um, it, with the council's uh, permission, I, I plan to go support that. And if there's issues that we need to bring up, please let me know. And then um, you have something to say on this? Please? Yes. Okay, um, please. Thank you. It's not on the agenda, so. Yeah, right, right, right. No, I, and, and, and I'm, I, I'm not looking for instruction now. Okay. okay. But I appreciate you bringing that up. So uh, if we do need to agendize it, uh, please uh, let, let the clerk, let the city manager know that uh, we need to agendize that. So, okay. And um, the other thing is um, I had a chance to talk with um, a member of the Rossmore uh, Los Al Sewer District. And um, the, the question comes up in terms of representation. So that's something I think we would probably want to look at here. Um, and this sort of, you know, in my mind, it, you know, the, the footprint of the sewer district covers um, the city of Los Al, um, Rossmore, uh, and a few portions of Seal Beach. So um, I'm not sure as far as if, if, well, I think we probably need to engage in some dialogue and then perhaps uh, if the council directs to uh, have a city uh, attorney look at um, that representation at the at the sanitation district itself. So that that just came up in a conversation. I think we had to um, evaluate that at some point in the future. And then the other thing is, um, there's been a lot of um, activities with the uh, Orange County Fire um, Authority, and and uh, there's going to be quite a few more meetings. But we're coming up with the uh, labor negotiations, coming onto that, and um, you know, we're doing the best we can in terms of trying to. Uh, deal with all the myriad of issues, but uh, certainly I think my, my sense of the uh, board of directors there, and there are 25 or so of us, and um, it, it, it's kind of like I, I heard it phrased this way. So there are 25 CEOs in this room, and we're trying to come up with the best solution that's so broadly uh, applicable. And, and uh, I think the thing that, uh, that I sense on this board is that we are trying to arrive at a fair and balanced um, outcome that will uh, improve on uh, delivery of fire services and, and public safety. So it will be in for, uh, I think, a lot of meetings. And you'll probably probably be seeing that upcoming in the, uh, the news and the media. And if there's questions, by all means, you can direct them to me. And I'll be happy to try and answer them as best I can. With that, I'll just turn it back to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I can go. Council Member Gross. Um, the various activities and events that I've participated in since our last council meeting are shown on our or on my website which is uh, losal.net um, this afternoon I received a an email from Golden State Water uh, indicating that they are partnering with the Environmental Protection Agency to promote a fix a leak week in California uh, from the period of March 17th to the 23rd, which means this week. A um, little disappointed that I get it the day that they're doing it. And we used to have a representatives from Golden State uh, attend the meetings. I don't know if anyone is here representing them. I don't see anybody unless they want to throw their hand up. Um, they're doing some programs uh, to help customers and Golden State uh, provides a service in in Los Alamitos where um, they believe that throughout the United States a trillion gallons per year are lost in uh, leaks and with water becoming one of our major resources that's being challenged and the drought situation that exists even though we had a recent rain we're nowhere near out of the uh, out of the woods I would encourage uh, residents and customers at Golden State to talk to them. Uh, they noted in the bulletin that 10% of the homes uh, have leaks that waste 90 gallons or more per day. Uh, common leaks in the home including, uh, I guess, poor toilet flappers, dripping faucets, other leaking valves that are easily correctable and they'll take care of that uh, in terms of letting you know where it is. Um, they have water reduction fixtures that are available. Um, 
Many can be done as a do-it-yourself, but contacting Golden State Water uh, over on Cherry Street um, should be able to help from the standpoint of resolving that. But uh, Mr. City Manager, you might reach out to them and find out if this is one of their meetings that they might want to attend uh, on a regular basis. Um, and that'll do it for me for right now. Oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. I did receive information today that there is going to be a major um, disaster response exercise on Joint Forces Training Base. Um, I believe it's to be in April, toward the end of April. That will involve uh, a large contingency of planes and response agencies. And as soon as I get that information, I'll pass it on to council and to city manager, and that may be something else that we'll want to put up on the website relative to, to any noise issues and factors like that that are going to occur. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure, I'll go. Do you want to go? Uh, just a couple things. So uh, had an opportunity. I wanted to thank the mayor for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, represent the city for the Americana Awards. Um, I wanted to congratulate again uh, Christine and Larry Braun, who are the Los Alamitos uh, Citizens of the Year. And uh, the Americana Awards is an awards uh, ceremony put on at Cypress College. And uh, the benefit of that is not only does it recognize the citizens in our community, but it also helps raise money for scholarships for students that can't afford to go to college and, uh, and be able to afford it. And they, we were able to raise uh, about 125000 uh, so a really good deal. Uh, Raul Alvarez, who's chaired that for uh, a long period of time, and our past uh, Americana recipients, uh, constantly are working with the community to get uh, a lot of participation. So I, I thought that was a great event. And I, uh, Mayor, I just wanted to thank you. Um, had an opportunity to go to the police appreciation lunch uh, earlier last week. Um, yeah. And uh, I just, uh, Chief, I just wanted to tell you, uh, you know, your, uh, your storytelling has gotten really good. And uh, the, uh, the stories that you illuminated our Officer of the Year and the awards, uh, that uh, different uh, activities that happened with our police officers really did them a justice. So I just uh, wanted to tell you, you did a great job. Um, a lot of people came up to me afterwards and just uh, really appreciated that. Um, you also had the opportunity to get the uh, kind of the chief of probation out there and with all the prison realignment stuff a lot of the questions that we get in the community are um, is this really affecting us with our crime stats and being from Greenbrook in my community and I know with uh, uh, Councilmember Kusumoto and College Park North and Woodcrest we've had a little bit of an uptick in uh, you know crime in our area but it's, uh, you've proven directly that it was an anomaly, but I think a lot of people put those things together. So I thought the uh, agenda was very appropriate and the community really appreciated it. Um, we have uh, Janice Shore in our, uh, I don't know, uh, city manager if you're gonna bring this up, but we have an employee that's been with us for a tremendous uh, amount of time and has become kind of part of our institution. Um, she uh, works uh, as the administration person for our city manager, and so she's seen a lot of city managers come and go, and she's uh, also been the, kind of the indirect glue behind her community. And uh, I, I guess uh, personally as a council member, I just wanted to pass on to her a happy retirement. And uh, we, I know that they're going to have a cake and ice cream type thing for her. And uh, Jerry might miss the donuts that Warren <laughs> ordered up for uh, the folks doing the hospital <laughs> stuff, but there'll be a cake that. there. Um, a couple things on the uh, sanitation district I just want to make you aware of. Um, this evening uh, before this meeting, I was in uh, Newport Beach going to, uh, providing an overview for a water reuse conference. Uh, the drought has brought a renewed interest in the sanitation district, and we have really positioned the sand district as being a water agency uh, since we recycle almost half of our water and put it back in the groundwater. So, um, you know, that uh, has been a really good thing. Um, I'm going Thursday to Sacramento to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Orange County Sanitation District. Uh, in my role as the chairman of that board, um, I'm there ceremonially. I'm also uh, testifying at the committee. We do have a bill, just so you know, uh, Councilmember Kusumoto, we are looking at the governance of the uh, Orange County Sanitation District, and we specifically are realigning Orange County's board with Yorba Linda and Yorba Linda Water. Uh, very similar, the local sewers were turned over to Yorba Linda Water from the city, and the city vouched that they are okay with the transition. Uh, to get that to happen, we had to uh, lobby uh, the Senate and the Assembly because that 
restructuring is uh, governed by an assembly act or a, a law. So we basically have legislation going, and so I'm going up uh, to testify on that and why it's a good thing. The issue I think that we'll run into, and I'm open to help facilitate maybe having Rossmore Sanitary take over, Low South Sanitary, is anytime you open up that act, there's two or three big problems on the sand district, uh, Westminster versus Midway City Sand, Irvine and Irvine Ranch Water District, and Costa Mesa Sanitary versus Costa Mesa. When I push this thing through for your Melinda, the first thing every legislator wanted to know is you're not going to start a war, are you? Um, so we've had to be very precise on the legislation. Um, I would more than be happy if you wanted to agendize the item, talk about it in good governance. Uh, my time as the chairman of that board after two years ends on June, and so I appreciate the council uh, giving me the opportunity to be appointed to that and, and to serve in that fashion. Um, I think uh, lastly, the um, you know, I think tonight with uh, a lot of the items that we're talking about with the uh, Sugar Beet Festival and stuff like that is, I, you know, I'm glad that we were able to get a conclusion on that. I, I, uh, I really do think that that's a, a fun event, and I think it's going to be great for our community. That's all I have. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Murphy? Yeah, I'm going to forego the usual listing except for thanking the chief and all the police for the police appreciation. I was happy to attend that. It was amazing that you were able to get a whole bit out of one pair of sunglasses. I think you have a second career when you retire from the police department. Um, I'd rather spend my time today calling for a community workshop that, uh, about planning for the, for the council here. I've been on the council 15 months. We've never sat down to set our goals. And to me, it's, that's, that's a basically rudderless ship. Uh, I think that when we spent 43 minutes discussing a $600 item tonight, uh, I'm sorry, we spent 37 minutes discussing a $600 item for 43 people here and the millions of more watching at home uh, over basically what came down to $600. If, we, if we'd written a little better staff report, half the items on here really weren't even in play and the insurance, as it turned out, wasn't really in play. Uh, but I would, I would like to reiterate that, that we need to do some planning as a city as to, I think our time's better spent as Where's the city going? I, I see us as a board of directors of the city, and <coughs> I think that's where our time should be spent, not, not on a $600 item. Thank you. All right, my turn. Well, I'll uh, elaborate on that a little bit. I had spoken with Larry in the past, and those were some of the items that he asked for. He had asked for uh, support for the insurance, and so it's really not on staff that it was written the way it was. I asked for as many options to give as, many, as much flexibility with the items that Larry had brought to me. Now, when he came tonight, he kind of pulled back on some of those, but nevertheless, okay. those were the things that he asked for us to address if we were going to move forward with some support. So that's not on Wendy, that's on me. Uh, I'll go ahead very quickly. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to Todd for having us over to the police uh, luncheon. Would you be willing to, uh, for the the community tell them the officers that received the awards and what they that what they received. Sure, the uh, our our officer of the year was uh, Officer Dan Brandt, who uh, spent the uh, at least the second half of last year in the uh, school resource officer position. Right. Our uh, police employee of the year is our records one of our two record specialists, uh, Lisa Scott. Mm -hmm. um, we. Uh, awarded uh, Officer Stacy Smith with a Medal of Merit for her involvement in delivering a baby at the Precious Life right. Shelter. Right. And uh, we awarded Sergeant Chris Carr and Corporal Paul Barbieri with the uh, Medal of Courage uh, for their involvement in uh, uh, capturing our uh, serial bank robbery suspect last year. Great. Thank you so much. I just thought it was worth noting for the community the things that they've done to, to uh, receive these awards and, and well do. Uh, I attended the ACCOC meeting and uh, there was some voting done there. We put in place the uh, officers for the next year. But there at the dinner, there were some really interesting things that were brought forward. Um, and uh, one of them, and I wanted to pass this on to, I guess, Stephen Mendoza, uh, Pedals and Feet, which is a SCAG grant that goes toward downtowns. And I know we're talking about potentially looking at the downtown on Los Al Boulevard. And so I think that any money that we could get um, that would help assist in that keeps us from having to put that money out. So I'll turn that information over to them. 
I know that we've done a uh, market study to some degree. We've had people come in, but I think that if we're going to revisit it, I would like to see the council potentially reach out maybe um, in different ways to get input from the community because I think like we talked about this earlier this evening, when they don't know what's happening as with the, uh, the construction that's going to be going on in Catella, um, people are taken back. I know that there was a little bit of controversy on the downtown having to do with traffic also, so I think that if we're going to move forward, we need to find another way to reach out uh, and potentially get to more people in the community so there's no surprise um, residents when we decide to do this downtown one way or the other. Um, another thing that they mentioned for a downtown area was a high school website uh, for the downtown and, and that would be for some kind of a decorative object that we could put. And I think if you engage the kids, you engage their parents and that's another avenue to get the information out. So these are just ideas that were mentioned. And then also they had uh, the chief of police from Fulton, Dan Hughes, and he talked a lot about the uh, the situation, the controversies they've had in their city. Really, really well-spoken gentleman, and I think he's the right guy for the job. But he talked about um, in kind of trying to overcome the the bad press that they uh, they put profiles on the police officers in the local paper. And I don't know what our budget is for something like that, but I've talked to you, Chief, about potentially some kind of a barbecue where the residents could get to uh, come and meet the police officers and have a more personal relationship. So those were just some ideas that came back from the meeting, and, you know, we can look at those in the future. Um, also, um, we're going to be meeting with the school district tomorrow, and I will make sure that we mention the Time Warner STEM, the Veterans Scholarship, and the personal interviews with the veterans when we uh, talk to them. Even though it's not on their agenda, we can have a little comment period at the end. And I would like to say to uh, Janice, uh, Janice Shore, she's been a huge support for us as council members. When you first come in, she's the one who kind of initiates you, and, and uh, she's always been there if we needed anything. So it will be a great loss for the city, and, and uh, we'll miss her very much. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead. Any... Uh, Comments from the city manager. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just I want to kind of reiterate some of the comments. Janice, she is her last day is March 27th, so and she's been with the city 18, almost 18 years. And she's only 29. That's right. <laughs> and uh, many years of government experience and many years of support here at the city of Los Alamitos. So she will be missed, and we will have a there's a party for her that the uh, city clerk's office is helping to organize next week. And um, also I want to thank Todd and and his staff for the police appreciation. I also thought it was a great event and it was outstanding, a really good feel for the whole community. They, you guys did a great job in that. And the Easter Egg Hunt is another event coming up on uh, April 19th, Saturday, 9 to 11. And you have the details right on that one, Corey? Yeah, it's uh, on uh, Saturday, April the 19th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., Little Cottonwood Park. It's our uh, annual spring carnival and egg hunt, and we definitely invite the community to come out and join us at that. All right. Dean's got something very quickly he'd like to ask. <laughs> we had talked earlier about nonprofits, and I wanted to mention that Precious Life Shelter, which came up, uh, and I think Corporal Smith uh, did the delivery on is celebrating 25 years of service in the community and has a, uh, a celebration dinner coming up on the 29th of March and so I wanted to kind of recognize them I know that uh, um, several elected officials are attending and providing a certificate so hopefully uh, the mayor can take care of doing something like that and a number of us are attending so Great. Um, we would we would appreciate something in that area, but congratulations to Precious Life Shelter on 25 years of service to uh, to the women in the greater Orange County area. Thank you. I, I guess one more thing. Something. Can you comment about race on the base? It happened right uh, after the last council meeting, so we haven't talked. Yeah, outstanding event, race on the base. And uh, Corey, you want to give details on the attendees and and the. Uh, there was a, a marked number, of, increased number of attendees from last year to this year. I think it's a great marketing efforts. Yeah, we had. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, uh, the uh, 
The race on the base uh, was the highest attended yet, 4,438 participants. Uh, very excited. We uh, had over 1,200 in our triathlon, which uh, allows us to retain the uh, largest reverse triathlon in the country in Los Alamitos. Awesome. That's very exciting. Um, thank you for attending and participating and being out there. We really appreciate it. It was a fun-filled day. The weather was absolutely beautiful, cooperated wonderfully. Um, uh, participants seemed uh, quite happy. Um, we uh, still finalizing a lot of the details of it, and uh, uh, we had a recap meeting internally. We've we reached out to the base for a lot of uh, uh, feedback from them and, and uh, gotten a lot of good information and, and great feedback from them. Uh, they, uh, they, they commended uh, the city and the partnership, and uh, it, it's been great and uh, already planning on uh, next year's. Uh, so everybody can calendar it Saturday, February the 28th, 2015. So uh, we definitely invite the community to continue to come out and support, and uh, uh, we'll definitely update you as, as uh, more updates come on. But thank Congratulations you. on a great event. Uh, city Attorney, could you take uh, closed session 12A, B, and C? Yes, um, council is going into closed session for labor negotiations with both um, organizations, the uh, police association and the uh, city employee association. And the uh, labor negotia negotiator for both is Gregory Cordner, former interim city manager. Um, council is also going into closed session regarding two items of anticipated litigation pursuant to subdivision C of government code section 54956.9, uh, two potential cases, and it would prejudice the interest of the city to disclose what those cases are at this point in time. Okay. We're going to recess into closed session.